The Roman Republic, as we find her at the beginning of Plutarch's life of Titus Quinctius Flamininus, is contending with a geopolitical theater that extends from the Straits of Gibraltar all the way to the Hellespont. Her enemies include Hannibal of Carthage, Philip V of Macedon, Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire, as well as barbarian tribes throughout Cisalpine Gaul and Spain. The Roman Empire will suffer setbacks and defeats, but she is destined to vanquish all of them. One of her generals is Titus Flamininus. Plutarch will refer to him throughout as Titus. So Titus is the Roman life that is run parallel with Philopemen, the, the Greek life. Philopemen was a megalopolitan, and he actually is the individual who was ruling that city at the time that uh, Megalopolis was destroyed during the life of, of Cleomenes. So it, it's interesting to remember how, how close some of these lives are and how overlapping some of these lives are. But the life of Titus is actually one of the most optimistic lives from Plutarch's perspective. In reading this life, this might be the most aware I've ever been that Plutarch is a Greek and that this book uh, or this life really represents a Greek triumph. He, he casts Titus as a Greek, calls him um, someone who has a, a Greek voice and language, and he casts him in the mold of the liberator of the Greeks. So Philip the fifth um, was the king of Macedon, and he allied himself with Hannibal uh, and Carthage in the Second Punic War to, to essentially no effect, and it sounds like Rome made a separate peace with him in the year 205 BC. And then he, when Hannibal was defeated at the Battle of Zama in 201 BC, Rome's attention turned to getting rid of Philip as, a, as an obvious liability, and so they sent Titus. So as far as, as Philip's position was concerned. Plutarch says this about it. It is true that the kingdom of Macedon furnished supplies enough to fill up for actual battle with the Romans, but to maintain a long and lingering war he must call in aid from Greece, must thence procure his supplies, there find his materials of retreat. Greece, in a word, would be his resource for all the requisites of his army, unless therefore the Greeks could not be withdrawn from siding with Philip, this war with him must not expect its decision from a single battle. That's the end of that quote. So one of the strategies is going to be untethering the Greek alliance. And now all of the Greeks were not allied with uh, Philip to start this, but there were certain Greek states that are going to have to be separated, and we'll get to that in a second. But this initial engagement, the moment that Titus lands at Epirus, where he has his first victory against the Macedonians, we see the Roman military machinery at its absolute finest and most efficient. And I, and I think there's something to be said here because I, I hope we don't take this maneuver that he pulls off, I hope we do not take this for granted. I, I want to point out a few things from, from World War II. I'm just going to get a few quotes from Stanley Hershen's book, his biogra biography of General Patton regarding some of the preparation that was necessary before they could make their first amphibious landings. Excerpts from General Patton's diary um, from 1942, when the Army and Navy were trying to coordinate practices for amphibious assaults um, in Chesapeake Bay at uh, Solomon Island, indicate he was very frustrated with how long it was taking. He called one landing very bad and referred to a transport commander as the worst. And once they arrived for the first time in the North African and Sicilian theaters, we have all sorts of problems. It took time to figure out how to coordinate these attacks. And so with this in mind, let's see what the Romans were able to pull off with this invasion. So when Titus lands with his troops and the Romans have the low ground, the Macedonians have the high ground. So the solution that they come up with is they, they find some local herdsmen who claimed to know about an undefended pass that could flank the Macedonians. And here's the line from Plutarch. 
When the day arrived that those who stole round were expected upon the top of the hill, he drew up his forces early in the morning, as well the light-armed as the heavy, and dividing them into three parts himself led the van, marching his men up the narrow passage along the bank, darted at by the Macedonians, and engaging in this difficult ground hand-to-hand -hand with his assailants. So they, <laughs> he sends out this force into the hills, never going to be able to see them again. This isn't like, well, this isn't like modern warfare where you've got radio. They decide on a day and just hope that the herd, these locals are telling the truth, that these locals are competent and know what they're talking about, and that the army is going to be able to march around and appear behind them. And in relying on the competence and punctuality of this relief force, they have to form the line of battle and engage the enemy without knowing whether or not their strategy is going to work. And it does. This must have looked like a miracle. And indeed, Plutarch describes it like one. Whilst they were struggling forward, the sun rose, and a thin smoke like a mist hanging on the hills was seen at a distance, unperceived by the enemy, being behind them as they stood on the heights, and the Romans also, as yet under suspense, in the toil and difficulty they were in, could only doubtfully construe the sight according to their desires. But as it grew thicker and thicker, blackening the air, and mounting to a great height, to a greater height, they no longer doubted but it was the fire signal of their companions, and raising a triumphant shout, forcing their way onwards, they drove the enemy back into the roughest ground, while the other party echoed back their acclamations from the top of the mountain. That's the end of that quote. I mean, there's certainly, this, is, this isn't this is just an incredible description of the Roman military apparatus and, and Roman coordination. It, it, that's ingenious. That's a harrowing decision to risk your life in battle. And it, we see that he's fighting himself, Titus, hoping that your, your friends just show up and they didn't get lost in the Greek mountains. My goodness. The other thing is there are certain segments that are very well written, like this one. They could only doubtfully construe the site according to their desires. Everything about that sentence, every, the word order, the word choice, is perfect. And I don't know if that's Dryden's genius or Plutarch's. We can sense their emotions in that moment. And this other well-written bit later on, while the other party echoed back their acclamations from the top of the mountain. This is, I think this is the best written of the lives I've read so far. Alexander was crap. I didn't say it, when it during the video, but it was crap, choppy, and awful. This is poetry. This, this is great writing. And, and I think part of the reason for that is that Plutarch, and we're going to move past this battle now, Plutarch likes this. He likes reporting this. Because this is the liberation of Greece. And following this victory, he describes how Titus moves from city to city, convincing Greeks to take his side. And this includes the Achaeans, who had been previously in an alliance with Macedon, as well as the Boeotians, who had been previously in, in an alliance, and they switch over to him. But, and one of the reasons he says that they did this is these are the words. For they had been told by the Macedonians of an invader at the head of a barbarian army carrying everywhere slavery and destruction on his sword's point, when in lieu of such a one they met a man in the flower of his age of a gentle and humane aspect, a Greek in his voice and language and, language, and a lover of honor. And like I had said, he, he casts him as a Greek. And as, as we move on into these lines, and he, he offers peace and friendship uh, to the Macedonians upon the condition that the Greeks be left to their own laws and that uh, Philip should withdraw his garrisons. Now, after these proposals, the universal belief, even of the favorers and partisans of Philip, was that the Romans came not to fight against the Greeks, but for the Greeks against the Macedonians. Now, the major battle comes a little later, the victory over the Macedonians at Sinocephali, which I think happened in 197 BC. And the reason why the Romans were able to prevail there is because of the rolling slopes of the land made it tough for the very heavily armored Macedonian phalanx. The strength of their phalanx was that they have to stay together in one big group. But because of the unevenness of the ground, they separate. And individually, they were very easy to dispatch because I guess their armor was just so heavy that they were useless in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so there's a great victory. 
And what happens next is there's a, there's a lot from Plutarch here about the acclamation that it, that comes to Titus Flamininus as a result of the liberation of Greece. In fact, he uses the word acclamation. I've got it circled at least three times. I think it's more. He loves he loves the word acclamation in in this in this life. And we're gonna get to what Plutarch might really have in mind in this great praise that he heaps on that he heaps on on Titus. He tells an anecdote. It was now the time of the celebration of the Isthmian Games, and the seats around the race course were crowded with an unusual multitude of spectators. Greece, after long wars, having regained not only peace, but hopes of liberty, and being able once more to keep holiday in safety, a trumpet sounded to command silence, and the crier, stepping forth amidst the spectators, made proclamation. And so this crier comes forth, and he has to, he has to make his proclamation multiple times. And finally, therefore, where therefore fresh silence was made, the crier, raising his voice, succeeded in making himself generally heard and recited the decree again. Uh, this is the decree that Titus and these ten commissioners from the Roman Senate are, con are going to confer liberty on Greece with no garrisons. A shout of joy followed it, so loud that it was heard as far as the sea. The whole assembly rose and stood up. There was no further thought of the entertainment, all were only eager to leap up and salute and address their thanks to the deliverer and champion of Greece. What we often hear alleged in proof of the force of human voices was actually verified on this occasion. Crows that were accidentally flying over the course fell down dead into it. So such a cry went up in acclamation. He uses the word acclamation in the next sentence. The crows fell dead in their flight. So such is Plutarch's description of the praise that is heaped on the Romans. But just in case praise is not enough, Plutarch adds this, and maybe you'll start to see where, where I was going with this, where I'm going with this. For their beneficence to the Greeks terminated not in empty praises only, for these proceedings gained them, deservedly, credit and confidence, and thereby power among all nations. For many not only admitted the Roman commanders, but even sent and entreated to be under their protection. Neither was this done by popular governments alone or by single cities, but kings oppressed by kings cast themselves into these protecting hands. So let's, let's think a little bit about what Plutarch's saying. I mean, he's writing at a time where he is himself a Roman subject. He's a Greek-speaking Roman, sub, uh, Roman subject under the Roman Empire at a time when Greece has, has been conquered because this is going to turn out to be short-lived because the Aetolian League isn't satisfied with this outcome. And they will invite Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire to come in and quote-unquote re-liberate Greece, and then the Romans are going to have to really come in and, and lay it down. But so what Plutarch may be saying is, look at all the praise that'll come to you, and all the power if you just liberate people. You'll get everything you want if you're just n nice. So there's a little bit of supplicant flattery here it, it almost seems like if you read the bible and, and read the way that um, the israelites praise cyrus who restored them um jerusalem in the book of ezra you, you'll see praise heaped on that um tyrant so it's just kind of something that's a little politic so let's get to the fun stuff because it's plutarch and plutarch cannot resist a nice amusing anecdote so we, we get this story that titus tells I supped once, said Titus, with a friend, and could not forbear expostulating with him at the number of dishes he had provided, and said I wondered where he had furnished himself with such a variety. Sir, replied he, to confess the truth, it is all hog's flesh differently cooked. Is, and isn't that the case? The diversity of eating a pig. And as, as anyone who's watching these videos might tell, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons, so let's play this clip. Eat any animal again? What about bacon? No. Ham? No. Pork chop? Dad, those all come from the same animal. <laughs> yeah, right. He's a, a wonderful, magical animal. <laughs> I need to start trying to get a Simpsons clip on every single one of these videos. That show has so many moments that are fit uh, for inclusion in a, in a broader discussion. But let's get this other story uh, from Plutarch. Titus had a brother... <clears throat> Titus had a brother, Lucius Flamininus, 
very unlike him in all points of character, and in particular, low and dissolute in his pleasures, and flagrantly regardless of all decency, he kept as a companion a boy whom he used to carry about with him not only when he had troops under his charge, but even when the care of a province was committed to him. One day at a drinking bout, when the youngster was wantoning with Lucius, I, I love you, sir, so dearly, said he, that preferring your satisfaction to my own, I came away without seeing the gladiators." though I have never seen a man killed in my life. Do you realize what this story is? A young boy was giving Lucius a blowjob while he's watching gladiators kill each other. I also find it amusing to see the word wanton transformed into verb form wantoning. That's a good one. I think you should, no, no reason that's unfit for modern use, I don't think. But the the whole anecdote is a nice reminder of the ancient of ancient ways, as we're hearing poetic elevation of virtue and liberation. All these, all these great wonderful words. And what happens next is that Lucius goes and arranges for someone to be killed right in front of him. So, you know, when you read Plutarch, he never lets you down, in including. A, a flipping great story. But now let's move on. This is going to be the first time I've ever gone into the comparisons. And like I had said, he's uh, Titus is compared with Philopimene. And like I had also said, out of all these lives, this is one where Plutarch's Greek bias is most keenly felt. I think Plutarch generally seems pretty objective. But in this one, he seems a little more biased uh, to, towards, towards his Greekness. And look at this sentence. This is him comparing Titus with Philopimene. If we examine the battles they fought... Philopimene, whilst he was the Achaeans' general, slew more Greeks than Titus in aiding the Greeks, slew Macedonians. So it's one of the distinctions he made. I don't care that Philopimene's Greek. He killed more Greeks than, than Titus did. Titus slew uh, Macedonians. And then another line later in this, these seven very simple words that make a strong statement about how important culture is and how important the culture in which we are nurtured is. These words are, in Titus's glory, Rome claims a share. Culture matters. And I thought about this during the life of Coriolanus to remind what that life entailed. Coriolanus was a Roman general who conquered the Volscians in large part. But when he was banished from Rome, he took over the Volscian army and marched on Rome and threatened it and took many Roman cities and had success against Romans themselves. And while his life does indeed testify, on the one hand, to the importance of good leadership and how the fortunes can turn because he changes his allegiance, can you wonder, reading the life of Coriolanus, that even when he was leading the Volscians, that he never ceased to be Roman? And that no matter what we do, we can never cease to be of the place where we are from. And that even assessing those Volskian victories under Coriolanus, could you say, much like Plutarch does here, that in those Volskian victories, Rome claims a share.